Okay, um, sorry about those technical difficulties, everyone. Um, internet connection out in the bush gave me a bit of problems, but um, we are ready to go. Um, I just want to start your start my video. <clears throat> so yes, welcome everyone. I'm Grant Beverly from the Endangered Wildlife Trust um, for today's Wild Chat Together part. Um, just some ground rules. You'll see that all the videos and, and microphones have been switched off. <clears throat> um, so, so please just um, stay with the microphone and videos disconnected during the course of the presentation. And you'll see that there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. <clears throat> please don't raise your hand, but you can type in your questions in that Q&A box. I will endeavor to answer as many questions as possible after after the presentation um, so the title of, of today's presentation is world about wild dogs and as i mentioned i'm grant beverly the low felt regional coordinator for the carnival conservation program I'm based in in kruger national park working within the the greater kruger national park um, so yeah let's start with with what is a wild dog <clears throat> a question that it may seem obvious to many, but you'll be pleasantly surprised about how few um, international visitors to South Africa, particularly in, in, in Kruger National Park that I've interacted with, actually know what a wild dog is. Um, probably one of the most uh, identifiable features is the, the large round ears, and the silhouette here is not a wild dog, obviously, but a, a silhouette of Mickey Mouse. And then probably one of the biggest misconceptions or misidentifying um, points in terms of the, well, the, the English name wild dog is often people assume them to be feral domestic dogs or, or domestic dogs that have gone wild, which is obviously not the case. So what exactly is a wild dog? <clears throat> wild dogs are completely unique carnivores. They are descendants of wolves. Um, but not directly late, related to wolves and not related to domestic dogs directly either. They actually become or come from a completely unique lineage, which I'll get into more details and in specific. Wild dogs are unique because they are incredibly s social large carnivores. They are cooperative breeders where all individuals in the pack help raise the pups. Uh, this picture here to the left is an example of a subordinate wild dog within a pack that's gone out to hunt and has come back to help raise the pups, which is really unique for a, a carnivore um, or any mammal species for that matter, that, that multiple individuals within a group um, help raise the pups, which is one of the aspects that, that makes wild dogs so appealing um, to individuals is their social structures being so unique and how caring they are of their young, even if it isn't their own. Wild dogs being so unique also have some, some really unique vocalizations. So I'm going to play uh, two quick recordings of their vocalizations. The more commonly known vocalization is a, a Twitter call, which wild dogs use when they're feeding or, or during interactive play. Um, the, the Twitter call is also used when they rally each other together. They psych themselves up together to go on, on a hunt. Now another call that wild dogs make, <clears throat> which is also completely unique, is a long distance contact call, which is known as a who call. Um, when individuals from a pack get separated during hunting, or if they get chased off by competing predators, they use this call to, to locate the individuals of their pack, which just once again reiterates their social bonds. Um, Please let us know in the question and answers at the end if you've ever heard this, this unique call that wild dogs um, make known as the, the who call.
It actually sounds somewhat similar to, to an owl, but really is unique and, and covers over long distances, up to five kilometers other packs or other individuals can hear each other. Um, now, just to go through some, from, some facts about wild dogs, um, if you remember, I said that wild dogs have a completely unique lineage. So in terms of their taxon taxonomy, a little bit of a biology lesson for, for those out there that, that may not know, but um, wild dogs obviously belong to the kingdom Animalia. Um, they are in the order uh, Carnivora or carnivores and in the family Canidae. So they are within the dog or wolf family, but they have a completely unique genus, Lycaon, and their species Pictus. So wild dogs are the only individuals or surviving individuals of the genus Lycaon. And loosely translated, it, translated, it translates to painted and wolf-like. Um, some unique features on wild dogs in comparison to other dogs and wolves is that wild dogs only have four toes on the front foot. So they lack a dew claw and their middle two toes are also fused together, which you can see in the, the picture here dictating the wild dog's toes fused together, which is quite unique. Then wild dogs also have multiple common names, particularly their mul multiple English names, <clears throat> often referred to as the African wild dog, the African painting dog, the African painted dog, the Cape hunting dog, and essentially was um, originally described by Temek in, in, in the, the name being Lycaon Pictus, meaning painted, painted wolf. In South Africa, other Afrikaans, well, other names such as Afrikaans names, refer to them as Bullahunt, or, or unique names, for example, the Shangan language, which is Mashloa. And then a big misconception or a big use of the word in a lot of the, the reserves or, or, or guiding industry within South Africa is to refer to wild dogs as Madash, which is actually um, not the correct local language or local Shangan language um, word for, for wild dogs. Wild well, dogs are also incredibly large ranging. So if we took an area the size of Greater Johannesburg, which is approximately 100,000 hectares, under natural circumstances, if this was a reserve like Kruger National Park, then this area could naturally sustain approximately 100 leopards, about 300 lions, and only 30 wild dogs, which really speaks to the fact that they're incredibly large ranging. And because they, requ they, they require these large ranges, they are often regarded as an umbrella species. So protecting the habitat requirements for wild dogs means that you're indirectly protecting a whole lot of other habitat for, for other species that occur within that same area. So why do we care about wild dogs? Other than the fact that they're just awesome, which might be slightly biased for someone that spent the last 10 years researching wild dogs in Kruger National Park, they are completely unique and, and in many ways they do make us think about our affiliation with, with man's best friend, the dog. But their unique characteristics also make them truly remarkable. The fact that they've got such strong social bonds and the fact that by indirectly conserving wild dogs, you're conserving so many other species because they act as an umbre umbrella species, makes them an important uh, conservation focus. And of course, because of that conservation focus, it's, it's also increased by the fact that wild dogs are endangered. They are South Africa's most endangered carnivore and the second most endangered carnivore in Africa, only to the Ethiopian wolf. And just exactly why has this resulted? So generally, there's been a decrease in range and numbers throughout Africa. The main driving factor being the increasing human populations fragmenting populations or, or fragmenting patches of available habitat. And Kruger National Park is the largest protected area that sustains wild dogs in South Africa, which we'll go into more details about their conservation status in South Africa um, in the next couple of slides. So if we look at wild dog range in South Africa, there's essentially <clears throat> three separate what we would call subpopulations. That's Kruger National Park, as I mentioned, the largest protected area. Then you have a second population which, which was established in, in 1998 through a collaboration of um, non-government organizations, reserves, um, 
government reserves um, and in establishment of the Wild Dog Advisory Group, which set out to develop a population separate to the Kruger population, a second population, through introductions into a number of reserves across South Africa, referred to as these meta-population reserves. And the initial goal was to have nine packs <clears throat> across, across uh, multiple reserves in South Africa. And we've reached that goal, in fact, increasing wild dog numbers by over 250%. And there's currently 15 reserves within South Africa that hold populations of wild dogs. Then we've got the free roaming population. And if all our followers have been following EWT's um, social media platforms recently, we would have seen the extensive effort that one of my colleagues, Derek van der Merwe, has gone through to, to relocate a, a pack of wild dogs in the Waterberg region um, in the central part of, of Limpopo. Um, and this is, this is one of the most volatile populations of wild dogs, these wild dogs outside of protected areas, because of the increased risk of the threats that they face, which is driving their population decline um, in particular. So if we briefly look at these threats, <clears throat> they are outlined as direct persecution, so wild dogs being shot, as a result of conflict with, with private farmers um, for livestock and um, rare high value game species. Um, wild dogs being knocked over on, on roads because they're traversing long, large distances, they're often um, using roads outside of protected areas. Um, snaring, which is, is on increase and the demand for bushmeat, particularly during um, economic crises is, is a, a cause for concern, both inside and outside of protected areas. And then human population growth and habitat fragmentation is probably still the biggest driver. And, and one of the key aspects of Endangered Wildlife Trust Wild Dog work is to expand the range and suitable available habitat for wild dogs not only in South Africa, but outside of, of South Africa in the historical range of wild dogs um, across Africa. Then if we look at Kruger National Park, where we've been monitoring the population for the past couple of decades, where monitoring started in 1989 uh, on monitoring the population of wild dogs in Kruger and counting individuals, we see that the result in 1995 was that there were 434 adults um, wild dogs uh, in 1995. And that decreased quite drastically by the time the survey was done in 2009 to 120 individuals. Where then EWT in collaboration with sand parks and other stakeholders um, implemented a long-term monitoring program for the population of wild dogs in Kruger to investigate all the threats that they were facing and any emerging concerns that, that may arise, where at this time is when in 2016 disease emerged as a threat for the population of wild dogs in Kruger National Park um, with the outbreak of canine distemper, which I've spent the last five years of my work focused on, on understanding that disease outbreak and vaccinating and targeting the reduction on the spread of the, of the virus. Fortunately, there was only one pack that was um, that succumbed to canine and stemper and Kruger at the time. And we, we managed to vaccinate over 50% of the individuals and has seen very positive results to curb the spread of, of rabies and canine and stemper within Kruger National Park. So that's been beneficial. The population has also recovered slightly since then, which I'll go into more details. There's also the distribution changes of the population between the early surveys and the later surveys in, in 2015, which was the last um, census. Um, you can see that particularly in the northern parts of the park, there's, there was quite a large um, reduction in the population, <clears throat> which then eventually guided Endangered Wildlife Trust to try and assess what the drivers of this decline in Northern Kruger were, given the fact that it's such a large um, protected conservation area, and um, what exactly was driving this population decline. And eventually then trying to establish a, a population again in Northern Kruger through an assisted recolonization of introducing wild dogs back into this area, which was done in 2017 and proved to be very successful with the pack denning and establishing. And even on social media platforms, you may see through, through Kruger sites or EWT's um, sites that more sightings are starting to appear in that Northern part of Kruger.
So in terms of those sightings, we encourage tourists to submit sightings of wild dogs, including location, details, the number of individuals, and photographs if possible, so we can identify each individual wild dog in order to establish and monitoring um, the population of wild dogs. So how exactly do we do this? So wild dogs' coat patterns are like a human fingerprint. They are completely unique. And each individual wild dog can be identified through a series of photos, which is exactly how we established the number of wild dogs in Kruger over the last couple of decades. So this is an opportunity for individuals to contribute to the research and ongoing monitoring of wild dogs in Kruger National Park, which then is used obviously to develop an identification kit for each and each individual wild park. To the top of the kit here, there's a, a nickname for the wild dog, a code, its sex, so male or female, how old it is or when it was born, which pack it belongs to, and when last that individual dog was seen, which is really important for going monitoring of each individual in Kruger. Then we also monitor the space use or, or the areas that wild dogs cover through the use of technology, tracking technology such as GPS tracking collars. In order to fit a GPS tracking collar, an individual wild dog is needed to be darted and while under steps, it is then put, um, or it is, is sleeping obviously, the GPS collar is fitted, the individual is woken up and we can monitor their movements. Now this GPS tracking technology enables us to record the areas that, that multiple packs of wild dogs have been moving at the same time. Um, so we see a map here from Kruger National Park of the multiple different packs of wild dogs and you can also see how they overlap in their home range or territories. So wild dogs don't defend a territory like large carnivores but their social structure ena enables them to move between um, areas and overlap. So a pack of wild dogs that you may see, may see in the central area of Kruger National Park can also move down into the southern area of Kruger National Park, um, which makes it quite difficult for, for research to monitor their movements individually unless you've got these GPS tracking collars. They also, as you can see from the map, move outside the boundaries of, of the protected area. So into rural communities, into um, high dense livestock areas and into to private game farm areas, particularly around the central region, um, around greater Hoodsprat, where we've got currently got four packs of wild dogs that we're monitoring outside the Western boundary. And these GPS collars are essential to monitor their daily movements and ensure that we can implement mitigation strategies for their, their ongoing success. So this was just a quick overview of the introduction to wild dogs, how unique they are, and some of the, the research that we've been doing um, in Kruger in particular after, over the last couple of years. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed listening to me. I will endeavor now to answer some of your questions. Um, just a comment from the first person that they have heard the, the who call from a pregnant female before as she got separated from a pack during a hunt. It was amazing to hear. Um, she directed it into the ground. Uh, do they always do that to make the sound carry further? Um, to answer that question, I wouldn't say always, but it obviously is beneficial because of the vibrations. When it's directed into the ground, it carries a lot further. And it is thought that wild dogs can then even feel these vibrations across long distances. Uh, the next question, why do wild dogs need such large areas to roam and hunt, particularly in comparison to lion and leopards? And this generally revolves around their high metabolic rates. So wild dogs are always moving, they are incredibly athletic individuals, so they have high met metabolic rates, which means they need to hunt quite frequently. And because if they need to hunt quite frequently, they need to cover large areas to ensure that they, they can find prey. And they also need to avoid other large predators like lion and leopard. 
Lion and leopard are a lot higher than wild dogs would be on the, um, the trophic level scale and are actually a, a direct competition for wild dogs. So they're required to uh, roam large areas to avoid areas where lion and leopard are occupying. Um, just another comment about having the privilege of hearing wild dogs who calling. Um, and an interesting question from Sabrina, would you say overall ex situ conservation is beneficial for wild dog populations? Um, it is quite a complex uh, question in terms of ex situ conservation or conservation outside of the protected areas um, or outside of, of uh, areas in the wild, which would generally be referred to as zoos. Um, historically, zoos obviously have had their part from an educational point of view and awareness, particularly internationally for tourists or individuals that can't access or gain access to, to um, conservation areas where they can see animals in the wild. But there's this increasing um, consensus that, that animals born in captivity or, or raised in captivity have very little conservation value in terms of the ability, particularly with carnivores, to be able to release them back into the wild. Um, and then I'm going to answer the last question, <coughs> which is how many wild dogs do you need to collar per pack? Just the alpha couple or, or many other individuals as well? Um, this depends on what the intentions for the, the collaring are. <clears throat> Ideally with a GPS satellite collar, we would only fit one collar to on, on, onto an individual. And in terms of the alpha couple, we would never collar the alpha female because this may inhibit her during the raising of pups or during the denning period. And she also goes underground for a period of three months, um, which we would, we, we would lose the ability to follow her then while she's underground in the den. Uh, long, one last question. How many wild dogs do we currently estimate there are in South Africa? There are currently just under 500. 450 odd in South Africa, 250 of those in Kruger National Park, and then the remaining individuals within the meta population, which are currently 15 reserves in South Africa, um, two that include introduced populations into reserves outside South Africa in Mozambique, which is um, Gorongosa and Karangani. Thank you very much everyone for, for watching this, this presentation. It will be made available afterwards for, for any friends and family that haven't had the opportunity to observe it. And we will um, share that um, through EWT's YouTube channel. Thank you very much and hope you enjoyed.